So our guest speaker today is Dr. Zhou Min, or Min Zhou, depending upon which side of the Pacific Ocean. That's right, yeah. Uh, she is the Chinese director for the Confucius Institute of, in Waterloo. Uh, also, you've established the Chinese Studies Center. Yeah. She's a professor and associate dean at the Institute of Literary Studies at Shanghai International Studies University. And she's also the associate editor-in-chief of the Journal of British and American Literary Studies. So she has a broad expertise in both Western and Eastern literature and culture. So we have a perfect person here to interpret Dr. Wendy Fletcher's art, which we heard about this morning from our president and vice chancellor. But this will be an interesting take on Wendy's art from somebody who is a Confucian scholar. So please welcome her. I'm very happy that I uh, am able to have this opportunity to share with you my understanding of Dr. Wendy Fletcher's paintings. I heard from Tony that this morning, Wendy has shared with you uh, a total of 18 paintings of hers. This afternoon, I am going to put her paintings in a broader historical context and in a broader uh, literary context as well, uh, in the context of art history uh, from expressionism to post to neo-expressionism in the context of modernity to post-modernity. And also uh, because I know that uh, this uh, series of Confucian paintings is a combination of not only of uh, Confucian values, but uh, in her paintings, maybe Wendy has told you uh, that she used oracle bone scripts uh, to indicate the theme of each painting. Rather than giving you a very broad talk about every painting, I am going to focus on one painting alone this afternoon. This is how we do literary work, research, uh, literary research, because I'm really, uh, my expertise, if I have any, is in the field of literature, not art. But I hope that this afternoon we can share with you each, our, each, each other our understanding of a piece of artwork. First of all, uh, I think Wendy uh, has told you that uh, last year she very generously donated a series of 18 paintings to the Confucius Institute, headquarters of Confucius Institute in Beijing. And uh, the ceremony, the donating <coughs> ceremony was held last year uh, December in Kunming. Uh, this is Dr. Wendy um, at the Global Conference of CI. Uh, they had an exhibition of her paintings. You know, this is her standing there. Um, this they they have a welcome banquet for the donation ceremony. Uh, this is our uh, Minister of Education, uh, and Wendy is was giving this painting. Uh, do you, can you guess which painting this is? You know, uh, these 18 themes, or rather Confucian values, are the themes that uh, Wendy uses to paint her paintings. See, we ha you have all this. This list was actually originally provided to Wendy Fletcher, not uh, by me, but by Professor Yan Li. So this, all these words are the translation, and the translations are provided to me uh, by Professor Yan Li. So maybe you, anyone knows Chinese here? Maybe you don't agree with the translation here, you know. So anyway, these are the 18 Confucian values uh, chosen by Professor Yan Li. Uh, for Wendy to, to draw upon. Um, this morning when I was going through my PPT, looking through these 18 values, I thought of one Bible verse. You, you read Bibles? 
at least you, you know you, you, you have a better knowledge of, of, of the, the Holy Bible than I do, right? In Corinthians 13, 13, there is a Bible verse called, Now what we have now is love, faith, and hope, right? In Chinese, it's 如今长存的有信,有望,有爱, right? Uh, we can compare the biblical values, actually, with that of the 18 Confucian values. We have um, xin, actually, in Chinese the same, but uh, Professor Yan Li translated in the face, actually. And we have love. But in this, Confucian values, actually, with my study also, we don't have a lot of uh, things about hope, you know. Uh, maybe it's because we have different sets of relations. With Christianity, uh, you have uh, a heaven to look forward to, you know, for the second, for the afterlife, you know. But uh, in, in, in our religion, especially with Confucianism, uh, what, what is more important is about now is about this contemporary life. But everyone has his own interpretations, of course. So you, you have seen all this, you know, humanity, justice, pr proper ritual, wisdom, etc. Let's go back uh, to, the, to this very painting. Which do you think, if you are the painter, if you were Wendy, which painting, which theme do you think this with the trees, fruits, color of green, red, white, blue, yellowish, you know, what, what could be the theme of this one? It's hard to tell, right? I couldn't tell, but, but I checked. I'm not going to tell you now. At the end of this presentation, maybe we will come back to this, okay? So, uh, as I told you, you know, Yan Li told me that she gave uh, Wendy the oracle bone scripts for Wendy to have inspirations from. You know, uh, this is actually a piece of oracle bone script. Actually, these are the same word, harmony. You know, all these are the same word, how many, at a different historical period, you know, this very word, harmony, was had demonstrated at different historical periods in these different shapes. I'm not, you are going to tell me which is the one that Wendy used in her paintings. Okay, we are, folk, again, we are focusing one on painting alone harmony. Now you know. So these are all the harmonies, okay? So this uh, is originally what our oracle bone script looked like. Oracle bone script has a very interesting history. It was thought to be the earliest, the earliest writing forms in China, in the history of, of uh, Chinese characters. Um, there are different <coughs> opinions saying Tao Wen, dating a little earlier, but uh, generally people still think uh, Oracle Bone Script is the earliest Chinese, existing Chinese characters. It was, it, it could be dated back to Shang Dynasty. You know, um, the finding of Oracle Bone Script is a very interesting uh, story. Oracle Bone Script, first of all, it was used at that time mostly in the Shang Dynasty, uh, mostly by the emperors for to tell about the future. You know, were used for divination. You know, wh which involved inscribing a question with a bronze pin, then heating the bones and inspecting the resulting cracks to divine answers to one's questions. 
And most of the questions involved hunting. If I go hunting today, because hunting in those days is very important. You know, it's people's, uh, it's people's uh, livelihood. You know, you depend on the things you hunt for food, warfare, weather. You know, in, in those, in those pre-modern pre times, we depend not on what we create, like today. A modern technology. We have weather forecasting. We have, you know, you name it. All the modern technologies. But in in back in those times, we depend on what nature has to offer. You know, if, if tomorrow you have a, you have got a storm, you you have you cannot go to work in the field. You know, and if the wind is against. Uh, you, if you don't have the right current, you, you cannot go sailing, you know. So, at that time, these oracle bomb scripts were mainly used for divinations, you know, for, for fortune telling purposes. This kind of practice, very interestingly, had uh, a very uh, long history, date even today. I have a son who is uh, 17 years old. You know, he, they back he is in he is a high school student now. He goes to WCI. Uh, but when he was back in Shanghai, he told me that they were doing a kind of fortune telling thing as I did. And what I did was what my mother did. You know, for fun. Not many people do this now, but you know it's like it's like you know you you hold something like a basket and you have a pen attached to that and you be, you, you you really focus and you begin to ask the divine God or whatever you know gods or God you know in, in the Chinese religion we don't only have one single God we have many gods you know in the family in the household you have the God of Arvin. You have the god, god of money. You know, you have many. You have the god. You have the god of the door. You know, you, we believe in many uh, the existence of many kinds of gods. So to come back to this fortune telling practice, you know, it has uh, come down to today. Not although not many people are doing this, but children would ask questions. They really think. They would shake and would scramble something. Something would be. Easy. Uh, inscripted and from there you interpret you know that's why you know in the Bible uh, I think um, in the Old Testament uh, you, I think we have many similar stories of you know uh, the, the kings ask uh, those people who work for him to try to interpret his dreams like the story of Daniel you know the seven years of famine you remember that? You must have a better knowledge than I do. You know, I learned that 30 years ago in my English class, culture class. We had a Bible class, you know, taught by an, an American teacher. Uh, anyway, you know, there are all together, maybe, it said, there are 500,000 pieces of oracle bone in scripts found. The finding, just now I said, the finding of oracle bone in uh, uh, scripts is an interesting story. There are two opinions concerning the finding of this uh, oracle bone in script. The most uh, widely accepted opinion, if you uh, go to do any research, you know, you will find nothing is so sure. You know, uh, scientists, uh, researchers have different ideas. But one of the most widely accepted opinion about the finding of Oracle Bone Inscript was like this. It was found by a high official in Beijing uh, when people were uh, trying to 
bring kind of medicine to cure his disease. Uh, because at that time, back in uh, 1890s, you know, in 1890s, people believed that dragon bones, you know, Chinese medicine, we use all sorts of things as, you know, medicine. At that time, people, it was believed that dragon bones make a very important medicine for serious disease. So people, uh, some people gave some to a high official, Wang Ruirong, to cure his disease. When he looked at these dragon bones, he was, because he is a man of letters, he's not only a high official, <coughs> you know, this has another story, because at that time, he, back then, China, how do, you, how do we select our officials through examinations, through very serious examinations. So all, many of those high officials are very knowledgeable. So he realized that this could be something very precious. So he began to look all over China to try to find where the dragon, bone were, dragon bones were excavated or found. It turned out that the dragon bone, the so-called dragon bone medicine, was actually oracle bone scripts, you know. Another thing that I just found when I was doing, uh, preparing for this uh, talk, I'm telling you this because I want to let you know that uh, when, when we are into the research field, Nothing is really within our boundary. In the university, we learn how to do research. You know, later if we encounter a new subject, you know how to carry out research. You know, so the critical thinking method uh, I, I read uh, uh, in, in Daniel's syllabus, you know, it's, it's, it's a, the methodology. What you learned, what's the most important thing you learned in university is the methodology. So when I was doing this, I'm not really an expert in, in oracle bone scripts. If I am, I will be super rich now. I'm going to tell you why I will be super rich if I am an oracle bone script scholar. Um, because, so, she, so he realized that this is something very important and he found uh, the place where this, the most oracle bone scripts were, were found, it was in uh, Anyang, uh, in a city in Henan, he was not the only person who found this is something very precious, historically, culturally. One of your fellow Canadian had the same <coughs> findings. And in Royal Ontario Museum, if you go to Toronto, have you, how many of you have been there? All of you, I, I, I'm sure all of you. Have you seen the Oracle bone script there? Any of you? In Royal Ontario Museum, there is the largest collection of Oracle, Oracle bone script outside China due to that, that's why I'm going, th th this is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to, come back to that Canadian historian uh, a little bit later. But these are some of the oracle bone scrapes. You can see this is person, <coughs> human, ren, <coughs> fem, uh, man, male, uh, woman, uh, child. Some examples, these are some of the answers. I, I told you that if I, could read, decipher oracle bones. We have 500,000. Now, what we can read is only about 4,500. <coughs> so the rest, still mystery to human beings. Yes? Probably an ignorant question, but what's the connection between divination of oracle bone characters and the I Ching? In, in the what? I Ching. 
Yi Jing, you know, Yi Jing the, the, is a book of changes, right? Um, Yi Jing was developed by Emperor Zhou when, when he was prisoned. You know, we have the saying that uh, during, when he was imprisoned, he, he thought of the changes of people's destiny, uh, human nature. So people, actually the book of changes is not only about divination. One of the secular functions that ordinary people would use, would go to E. G. and they would, be, they would think, oh, with E. G. you can tell your fortune. You know, but it's not only about that. It is much more um, philosophical. You know, it's about the whole uh, universe, which is still a mystery. And even in China, uh, again, I'm not I'm not an expert on the book of on I Ching on the book of changes. You know, we we don't have that many, and people have different interpretations about that too. So, but. In secular uh, usages, people use I Ching to, to tell about your fortune. I know many masters. You know, by looking at you, by look, reading your face or reading your palm, but just looking at you, they can tell what your fortune will be like. Are you going to, what kind of husband are you going to find, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, just now I, I, I said, if I am an expert of Oracle Bones Creek, I would be rich. That's true. Because, uh, I don't know whether I can open this link. You have we? to go and click, I'll, I'll help. It's okay, we don't have to. We don't okay. have to, Tony. Mm. So in this, it's Global News Canada, you see? Uh, Chinese Museum. Chinese Museum is offering Eighteen thousand dollars for decipherment of any ancient text. If you decipher one word, eighteen thousand. You know because yes. And if someone, how would they know if I am telling the truth? Like how would they know that I'm right or wrong if they don't know? Um. Well, it's not easy, but but it's like with any anything ancient, we you know compare. And you com you compare scripts with scripts, and you have many other many other documents to prove each other. You know, with the as for the meanings of specific Chinese words, even among Chinese scholars, there are disagreements, but there are common uh, understandings too. Because you can mutually prove things, you can you, you use the other document to prove this. Because there, I, I see that character similarly, you know, the from the development, blah 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 blah. You understand? You know, I think it's it's like you know the Egyptian uh, words, two characters, right? So th there is uh, there is a system uh, for the uh, uh, experts to know. You know, so anyway, that that is. Um, let's come back to the Canadian who found the value of oracle bone uh, scripts. So this news is about you know the uh, uh, Royal Ontario Museum is offering a scholarship for Chinese research researchers to do. Uh, works on the Chinese characters in the museum. I, this fellowship actually was established by uh, James Mellon uh, Menzies' son, Arthur uh, Menzies. It is James uh, Menzies. He, he has actually got a Chinese name, Ming Yi Shi. He is a Canadian missionary. He, he, in the beginning, he was an engineer graduating from UFT, but he decided that he didn't, you know, that was not his calling. So he, he, he went to China, 
you know, joined the uh, joined the missionary group, and he he went to China, Anyang. This is the place where the Ark of Mount's Grace were found from 19, actually from 1910. Another document said from 1910 to 1936, 26 years, he stayed in China in doing missionary work. And at the same time, after finding the oracle bones, he, was all, he also became a historian, you know, an archaeologist. He was, he, he was also teaching at Qilu University. In 1936, he went back, he came back to Canada for a holiday, but he couldn't go back to China after that because, you know, the, uh, we know that in the Second World War was breaking out, and Japan in 1937 invaded China. Uh, so he couldn't go back to uh, China anymore, so he left all his oracle bone there. There, but how did all these oracle bone scripts came to Canada again? Two sayings. <coughs> again, you, you know, you read the different things, you know. Don't just believe whatever you read. You have to make your own research, you know. It's not like whatever you read from the books are the truth. Now we know that. Everyone should know that, you know. Uh, even our history books, you know. Two years ago, I, I was asked to, to give several lectures uh, in several American universities about, you know, Chinese textbooks. Uh, it's, it's recently I'm, I'm doing a research, Tony has helped me about, you know, how uh, Canadian textbooks are representing Chinese in your history books. You know, at different historical periods, what we read changes. As you know, a very famous French philosopher, Michel Foucault, said, "You know, knowledge is not only knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge is is not only about knowledge. Knowledge is about power. What can be categorized categorized as knowledge is not decided by knowledge per se, but by the power. You know. So that is why when I was reading this, I never tell my students what I." do or what I write is, is the right thing. You know, you, I'm, you can always criticize what I'm doing. Good, argue against me. You know, that, that, is, that is how we develop our mind. That is how we develop critical thinking. In the long run, that's, what, that's how human beings move forward by negating ourselves. You know, otherwise we, we would just say the same. So again, coming back to the story anyway, the Canadian version, <laughs> the Canadian version of the story was, you know, uh, James couldn't go back to China. He didn't ask for them to be sent to Canada, but his friends there thought it was his idea because he collected all of them, so uh, they sent them here anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, in some way, because all these about uh, 50,000. Again, the numbers, uh, people vary according to, uh, in regard, in, in terms of the numbers, how many pieces. You know, if you read different things, they have different, uh, but approximately, you know, 30,000 to 50,000 Oracle Bond inscripts were shipped to Canada, and they are now stored in Royal Ontario Museum. If you're interested in, you can, interest in, in this period of history, you can go there. You know, maybe next to trip, the first thing <coughs> you should do is to go and have a look. Uh, so this is um, James, and later her, his son, Arthur, you know, was, who was born in China, became the Canadian ambassador to China. And he donated his father's research, not the Oracle Bones, to Shandong University, you know, because his father used to work in Qilu University, uh, same province. Okay. Uh, this this is the missionary uh, James Mesmon, and this is the uh, Royal Ontario. I got all this online, uh, so this is uh, you can find that 
there. Um, so much about the history of the oracle bone scripts. Today I'm going to focus on one painting I said at the beginning, uh, the painting of harmony. You know, harmony. Harmony is the reason why I choose the theme of harmony among the 18 themes of Wendy's paintings is because in my understanding of Confucian values, again, people have different understandings, even with the core Confucian values, you know, with Christian values too, I, I, I feel, right? So harmony, I think, is uh, one of the core Confucian values. Um, the meaning of harmony in Chinese, harmony, what does harmony mean? Harmony is not <coughs> about being alike to each other or being the same as each other. Harmony, to my understanding, first of all, if, we, if you realize the importance of harmony, you already realize the existence of difference. Without difference, harmony is not meaningful. Because, you know, it's, it, it's like, if everyone is the same, <coughs> we don't have to have harmony. So, in Chinese, the, the most famous Confucian sentence, I think the most important one, is, which speaks to today's world, you know, is harmony in difference. Harmony in difference. You know, in the Chinese tradition, in many of our different kinds of practices, this notion of harmony in difference, harmony in recognition of difference, harmony in respect of difference, is deep in the Chinese uh, fields of life. Even in cooking, you know, with cooking, we we don't only have one taste. You add different ingredients into this in order to make a harmonious taste. Harmony, that's why, is a very important notion in Chinese uh, values. And we know that just now, Daniel talked about Yi Jing, right? Uh, the key notion of Yi Jing is about the balance, right? Balance of yin and yang, right? Have you heard of the yin and yang? Yin and yang, it's a dialectical world. I am a woman. Women belong to the yin. Men belong to the yang. The earth belong to the yin. The, the sun belong to the yang, you know. A one woman, al woman alone does not constitute human race. It takes women and men. Oh, more than others. You know, we have the LGBT groups now. You know, that, so, to, to look at it in a broader view, east and west. You know, we need to, east and the west, harmony is important. How can we maintain harmony? We realize we are different. We respect each other's difference. In this way, harmony could be possible. Otherwise, you know, you are uh, you, me are, uh, you know, we have to encounter the other in order to realize our identity. You know, without the encounter of the other, the identity doesn't count. You identify with yourself by merging with the other. I don't feel I am a Chinese if I stay in China. If I come to Canada facing you, I realize, oh, I am different. 
I, I realized my identity of being a Chinese. Again, identity is such a <coughs> complicated concept. What is our identity? What makes our identity? It's culturally, physically, biologically, it's very different. Uh, it's a it's another very complicated story. But anyway, <coughs> harmony, you know, you, you want to have the harmony of yin and the yang, the harmony of the east and the west, nature and culture. These are all the things that have been advocated in the Confucian values. Nature and culture. Is this important? Of course. Look at climate change. We just we have just had the warmest autumn. <coughs> Four season in in the past 50 years in Canada, I heard, right? It's so warm here. It has been so warm, right? So, what? Why? Climate change, global warming, you know, because we have destroyed the balance between nature and culture. Human beings belong to culture, nature, you know, the balance, the harmony has been destroyed. Okay. Now let's, we come to the painting, finally. After my explanation of harmony, and harmony in a historical background, what do you think is or are the colors of harmony? If you are to paint harmony, what color do you want to use? Anyone? Yes, please. All of them. All of them. Good, because it's it's a uh, yeah, very inclusive, right? Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? I am no painting. I am no painter. I don't have any artistic taste. Yes, please. Uh, there's gonna be black and white. Black and white. Okay. Yeah. You are so smart because you know with Yijing, black and white, you know? The yeah, yes, the yin and the yang, yes? Yes, that's a very Chinese character of harmony. Okay, anyone else? <coughs> okay, if not the color, what do you think could be the shape or the form of harmony? If you are to depict, yeah, Daniel? No, I would think a circle. A circle, yeah. But I and think both the colors and shapes would be culturally specific. Yeah. Like no Chinese man would want to wear a green hat. <laughs> Don't ever give a Chinese man a green hat. You will be insulting him. Because a green hat because then you said, you know, uh, green, uh, colors are culturally specific. You know, a green hat in the Chinese culture, Tony, do you, you, you wouldn't want a green hat. No, not at all. No, <laughs> it means your, your girlfriend, your wife would, you know, uh, be adulterous, you know, sleeping with Don't other men. Wear a green hat? Yeah, that, that's, that's, you know, well, I give you a green hat. That means, oh, no, you don't. Your head is not green though, right? <laughs> that's not green. That's green. Your head is green. Yeah. Green, green hat. No, gray. What's gray mean? Gray does not really have a particular color. But gray, we are going to talk about gray. Okay. When we talk about German expressionism, when we, we, are going to, you, we are going to talk about the four horsemen in your Bible, the apocalypse. You know, the, uh, the green horse, the red horse, the black horse, the red horse. Uh, <coughs> maybe that people say that's one of the reasons why German Expressionism has a school of uh, blue riders on horsemen. You know, we're going to talk about gray hat. I'm, going to, I'm not going to tell you now, okay? So, so uh, anyone else, the shape of harmony? Then you said it's circle? You all agree? <coughs> Everyone agrees. Okay. Oh. These are Wendy's paintings. Why two? 
Yes, two. The reason why I gave you this two is because he, she does have two versions of harmony. The reason why you need to know about the two versions is because versions are part of your expertise in doing any research, you know, with painting, with literary work, you know, you have different versions. Which version are you talking about? Are you citing from? Understand? So this one, as we can see in the middle, is the oracle bone inscribed harmony. And this is the simplified <coughs> Chinese character harmony, right? And this is on her website. This is the one that was donated to China and that was on display in the university club last year. <coughs> you, Daniel and Tony, you know about that, right? Mm -hmm. Harmony. I took the picture from the university club, this, this one. Look at the colors Wendy used. Were the same? Were you at Wendy's lecture this morning? Same class, different class. No, it was a different group. Oh, it was but a different it's, group. It's yeah. Recorded, it's on PowerPoint. The lecture. Oh, uh, did, did did she talk about the the colors? Yeah. So if Wendy were here, it would be it would be very interesting. You know, we can. Why would she have chosen such colors? See, I'm not going to tell for Wendy why she choose such colors, red, yellow, blackish, dots, you know, all this. It's like sun sprays, right? And this is more like, you know, the shape is different. Okay. So what do you see in the paintings? We already, you know, can you describe a painting? Yes, please. Well, the spiral, like if you go back to the spiral, the opposite sides of the, um, the spectrum show the complementary colors. Yes. So blue matches the orange, cool. and purple matches the uh, ah, yellow, and then red matches the green, which we're talking about harmony being in different, like yin and yang. Perfect. So it shows the difference between those two things. Uh-huh, great. In the order that she showed. Uh-huh. Yes. Anyone else? Okay, versions. We talked about you know two versions, right? You want to pay attention to the versions. Painting, you know, with painting you also want to pay attention to the material <coughs> it was used. Because it could be on canvas, it could be on wood, you know, it's very different. Okay, so talking, we are now, com we are now coming to the uh, art itself. The artist's statement. These are quotations from Wendy's web uh, page. You know, she said, she, her technique uh, was that from neo-modern expressionism. That, that's her frame of reference. And what she really cared, what she cared most in her creation are colors, right? She, 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 she really has a very strong feeling for colors. You know, she, she gave it, she leave it for colors to communicate her feelings, okay? Uh, and she also said that inspired most directly by the traditions of uh, the Bo Rader and the D book schools, when they believe color communicates at least as deeply as form. These two schools are German expressionism. When they said she was most directly inspired by neo expressionism, uh, neo modern expressionism. People say neo expressionism also, probably more often. So we will look at these two schools. These, 
these are German words, you know, expressionism. And these, at the, be at the beginning of 20th century, new expressionism, together with the rise of postmodernism, uh, came to existence in the 60s and 70s of last century, okay? So, this is uh, the bridge, okay? Uh, you know, the, the, yeah, this, the, the I, don't, I don't read German very well, maybe you do, yeah. So this is one of the school of thoughts that Wendy got her inspiration from. Um, this is actually an artistic group formed in early uh, 20th century. It's called the Bridge. It's actually it's Dresden. Dresden, you know, in the Second World War, right? Uh, a famous tragic slaughter happened there, you know, by the German uh, army. There is a very famous novel, Slaughterhouse Five, uh, by, you know, uh, Slaughterhouse Five. Kurt by Kurt Vonnegut, you know. Yeah, that he's, you know, you should read, you should all read. Monica. I would be more excited when I when I am to talk about literature, you know. But anyway, so this was formed in Dresden in 1905, last state like for eight years. Uh, it is the first manifestation of expressionism in German art. Major these are the peoples. Major contribution to modern art was the revival of printmaking, often compared to falsism for its use of, remember, remember, what's most important about the bridge is their use of color and the shared interest in primitivist art, crude drawing technique, and opposition to total abstraction. Expressionism. What, what does ex to express mean? You know, all these expressionism sounds very hard to understand. Actually, no. When we express ourselves, it's, expressionism is about the expression of the artists, the artist's expression of their understanding, their subjective understanding of the outside world. You know, this is the time, the beginning of the 20th century, is not only the, not only witnessed the rise of modern art, but also the rise of modernist literature. You know, modern technology had taken over human beings for the first time to a large degree in history, feel alienated from their true self. You know, in art, it is expressionism. In literature, it is modernistic, modernistic uh, techniques. The most uh, widely discussed and the easiest to understand is stream of consciousness stream of consciousness. What does stream of consciousness mean? It, with expressionism, you go back to the artist himself. With modernist writings, you go back to the writer itself. To, to the, maybe it's not, it's not right, it's not 100% uh, correct to say that, but Let's try to understand the stream of consciousness. What is Just now, when I was talking, you may be thinking, oh, who is this Chinese teacher? You know, her English is broken, grammatically a lot of mistakes. What she was talking was not interesting. Oh, so I like her scarf. You know, that's a pretty scarf, I hope. You know, you didn't really actually when I ask you to reflect on what you have been thinking just now, you realize your thoughts. You may be thinking, oh, Confucian values, harmony, 
difference? What does all that mean? What, what, why is Daniel inviting all these alien speakers here? What, what is it to do with our course? <laughs> you know? This may all be you in your unconscious, unspoken out, you know? But by, with modernist literature, with this, I will hurry up. With, 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 with art forms, like expressionist art, like modern literature, you realize you have a better understanding of your inner self. You know, we come back to ourselves. It's different from impressionism. You know, we know that in the art of history, uh, that uh, of, uh, you know, the, hey, it escaped my, um, the, the famous French impression is, yeah, Monet, yeah, you know, all this, uh, the parliament building, impressionism is about the object, is about what you see there. Expressionism is about how you feel here, you understand? So it's easy to understand, it's not that mysterious, okay? This is the bridge. Just now I said, you know, they are often come. Go ahead. Uh, they are often compared with Fauvism. Uh, Fauvism is also a kind of, you know, almost same period of time, uh, a, a form of modern art, you know, more inspired by that of Vincent van Gogh, you know, and uh, Gauguin, you know, you are very, people are very familiar with, with the first two, I, I know many, and I, 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 I hope each of you will be familiar with, with that, you know. So, um, with Fauvism and Expressionism, you know, why they're always compared, co compared together is because, you know, remember Wendy's statement in her web page? Color, how color communicates as well as form, her meaning, so the use of intense color as a vehicle for describing light and space, you know, color and form as means of communicating the artist's emotional state. So they are the precursors to Cubanism and Expressionism. Okay, so uh, these are two examples uh, made by the, the Bridge School. You know, the first one, that's why you have to go to a museum. You know, you, here looks the same, right? But actually this is, this stunning child uh, actually, is from the Los Angeles Country Museum of Art. It's color woodcut. It's on wood. But here, you, you cannot tell. You know, this one is on canvas. It's a portrait. You know, it's in the Ber in museum in Berlin. These are all the you know expressionists. You know, the the Bridge School. You know, their work. Walter Benjamin had something very interesting about modern art in the age of. Uh, uh, mechanical reproduction, <coughs> right? Daniel and Tony, you must know about this. You know, we see, we look at these paintings. Oh, the paintings. <coughs> you maybe you, you, oh, you, you can be shocked. But these are the reproductions. You have to go to the original work, go to the museum stand in front of a piece of oracle bone inscript. Stand in front of a real Van Gogh, Monet. You know, you can feel the spiritual interaction between you and the artwork. With what Benjamin, it is the aura of the artwork. You know, with reproductions, you get shocked. Wow, this is abstract. Look at this, the, the shape, you know. You may be shocked by that, but you, you never can encounter the aura of the painting, which is a spiritual connection between the artist and his work, which can be partly, at least, transmitted to between you and the artwork. You know, it's something, um, 
I don't have better word, aura, you know, aura. You know, you have to let, let art speak to you. You know that? So this is uh, their work. And this is the other school. Uh, you know, when they said she was in directly influenced by two schools of modern German expressionism. The first one is the bridge, right, Dresden, right? Uh, and the other school uh, is uh, dear blood writer is actually the blue writer, the blue writer. Simultaneously, almost simultaneously, a little later, you know, a little later, you know, than uh, the bridge. The blue writers. Why is this group named the blue writers? People have different opinions. You know, this is. Their uh, painting again. You know the blue writer. See, this is their manifesto. You know, but this is their blue writer. Their like their the very painting. Why is it called blue writer? People have different understandings and different uh, interpretations. You know, some say some argue that some argue that. You know, you, this is literature review. When you write something, you know, you, you list what other people say and you analyze them. So some argue that the name was taken from a Kandinsky. Kandinsky is a Russian, actually, uh, artist, you know, uh, belonging to this group. You know, he was the most famous in this group. Uh, Done in 1905, titled The Blue Horseman. The horse rider had been inspired by Russian folk tales. Uh, another one is St. George atop a horse, slaying a dragon in the foreground. It is thought that St. George was used as a symbol of the artist's spiritual role of rescuing innocence. <coughs> this is very important. This sentence is very important for the understanding of expression. Spiritual role of rescuing innocence from the ravages of materialism. At the beginning of 20th century, Technology begin to take over. You know, engine is is uh, is developed, was already invented. So, innocence was lost. Innocence lost. Human beings, innocence lost. What Whitman? What Whitman? You know, the, the famous American, uh, the American poet, has poems about innocence, right? So, and you have many literature talking about how European lost their innocence, right? Well, America, not to say Canadian too, still had their innocence. You know, so the encounter between American people and the European people are the encounter between the innocent and the you know the loss of the innocence. You know. So another explanation about the naming uh, type entitling of this group thought is the horse rider was an allusion to the four horsemen of the corpse. Uh, Apocalypse. You have to teach me how to read this word. I, I, apocalypse. Ap 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 apocalypse. Apocalypse. Yes. Apocalypse. I'm going to tell you the great hat. The meaning of the great hat in a minute. Okay? Oh, Professor, so unfortunately they have to do a peer critique. Oh. I promise them. Okay. Uh, I'm going to finish this in five minutes. Okay. That'll leave us 20 minutes. For the okay. Sorry. Sorry. I, I, I went to. I spent too much time on the oracle bone. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, but I, I'm sorry. I should have uh, had a better sense of time. Okay, so anyway, the this is the four horsemen in the Bible. You know, you have the, this is the grid. Okay, different, but doesn't matter. You know, so the, why do they want to use uh, the blue? Maybe a different, um, a different inspiration add to the faith of the human being. This German expression to school summary. And the key ideas we will not come. New Expressionism is, is more like postmodernist art. It came into existence in the 70s. It's more co commodified, you know. It's more uh, intermingled with market, you know. So it's just anything like postmodernist art. Uh, so actually, I kind of uh, fail to see the postmodernist things in one of these paintings. You know, I, I wish I, I could see more, you know. So. This is German New Expressionism. Uh, I have to say one sentence about Chinese freehand painting. Because Expressionism is about expression. Chinese 
calligraphy, uh, Chinese painting also has the free hand painting. It's also about expression of the artist's inner self. These are the examples, okay? Uh, harmony and more. Okay, so that is, you know, Chinese characters developing from uh, hieroglyphic to ideograph, from form resemblance to meaning resemblance. That speaks to when that speaks to artwork too, you know, uh, from form to meaning, and the root of expression to uh, neo in, in the context from modernity to postmodernity. I gave you a basic uh, uh, line. Meaningful forms and colors are what when they mainly uh, wish to use uh, or to express uh, in her art. These are the uh, web pages of, of her art. Sorry, I've taken too much time. No, 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 Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful art history lesson. Thank you. A semester of art history in oh. 45 minutes. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. And now uh, you can give me the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, I can post it in the house space. So if yeah. they want to see it yeah. again. Yeah. So we'll have to forego questions because I do want to leave people uh, 20 minutes. But I, I hope that uh, Professor Joe can uh, come back to some class. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, she's going to be here for a